Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started with the first question. Um, what got you both, right, and either of you can start, uh, in the topic of Muslim-Christian relations? What kind of sparked that journey? Um, if you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I, I grew up in uh, Saudi Arabia going to American schools. Uh, so even before I made it to the United States, I mean, we came for a visit one time, but, but to, to live here at the age of 18, um, I was very Americanized, right? So I thought I knew all about America. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, I knew about Paul Bunyan and the Oregon Trail and uh, all of these things where basically probably I received an education in these international American schools was very much like yours growing up. Uh, but one thing that was not taught there, which I discovered once, uh, once I came to America, was Christianity, right? So public school curriculum, even in international um, American schools. So um, coming here as an undergrad, I was also, I, I, I resonated with uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Lim was saying. You know, uh, begin to ask the big questions. You know, why are we here? Who am I? What, uh, you know, um, what is the purpose of my life? What, how should I live my life? The big questions that, you know, many of you, I'm sure, are asking and people ask some all, uh, uh, in, in their lives. And, uh, and these two things kind of came together, right? So I, I discovered, you know, the, the, when, I'm, when I started asking these questions, I started looking at the Quran, at Islamic tradition. I was raised in it, but I was never very practicing until I came to the U.S. And... Um, but also looking at all other religious traditions, reading Bhagavad Gita and uh, Tao Te Ching and, and, and the Bible. But because Christianity was so important to the culture in the United States, it, it gave me immediate access, right? So I could go to churches, I could talk to Christians, um, I, I, I could um, explore Christian texts, discuss them with people. Um, yeah, I realized that, you know, in order to really, you know, in this new culture now that I had adopted moving to the United States, that Christianity was a, a, such a central part of it that I needed to, to really learn from it, of learn about it and, and be in exchange with, with, with Christians. So at least that's part of the, uh, but then the journey goes on, right? So, but I, I don't want to hog the conversation, so... <laughs> Right. Yeah. Okay, so my interest, because uh, I just remembered, I, I got to talk short and succinct. So, um, how many of you were born on 9-11-2001? Okay, I know, like, how many of you are like, okay, yes, born before 2001? Okay, how many of you are born after 9 uh, 2001? All right, okay, thank you. So, um, so I became more aware of Islam, like many Americans, after 9-11, as a result of 9-11. I began teaching at a theological school in Boston called Gordon-Conwell on 9-11-2001. I walked up the hill to go to my classroom, and I was told that something happened, and my father-in-law um, my wife's father was visiting, uh, and he was supposed to fly that day on 9-11 from Boston. But then my wife somehow prevailed upon my father-in-law to stay. So like many other Americans, I, I became aware, I was notionally aware of the fact that Christians and Muslims, you know, haven't always gotten along. But then I also knew that because of the architecture and because of the text that Islam has created, that I knew it was a religion of peace. So I became much more interested in learning about that uh, while I was at Gordon-Conwell, but it didn't really start until 2008. And this is when I began living with Muslim students in my house. So there are 150 students and at least like 10 to 15 were, and then they were, they, were, they were asking me, can we get halal food? And I said, yeah, let's try. This is Nashville, Tennessee. And, and there weren't that many options, but... There was actually an increasing number of Somali population in Nashville, so we began to look at opportunities for that. And so I think my interest, beginning with 9-11, but it sort of didn't really grow until I started to really live with Muslim students and hearing their stories. 
And I think that's my kind of growing conviction is knowledge becomes really real when you share with somebody else, when you live with somebody else. So I think that's how I kind of began to be much more aware of and committed to learning about, uh, you know, the Islamic uh, history and Christians kind of intersectionality in that narrative. Thank you. Um, and if I could share a little bit, um, personally, right now, I serve um, as chaplain here um, to the Muslim students, kind of in a volunteer capacity, supporting um, them, advising them. But in a more um, career-based, um, I, I have been doing training as a chaplain at the hospital. And so um, I'm a part... I completed my internship and will be doing a residency soon. And one thing that I noticed um, doing chaplaincy is realizing that the concept of chaplaincy is not something that um, is traditional to Islam. Um, you won't find a word like chaplaincy in the Islamic tradition, but you, what you will find is spiritual care. And so the concept of spiritual care and finding a lot of the same, you know, finding similarities in terms of the teachings, right? Um, the concept of a wounded healer, finding the concept of, you know, supporting um, the emotional and spiritual needs of people, um, especially in a setting like the hospital where there is so much going on, especially right now with COVID and, and, and the, you know, people being lonely, separated from their family, end of life care, all those type of things. Um, I think for me has been the most um, influential being a part of a team where I'm the only Muslim. All, my colleagues are all Christian. And so finding kind of, um, you know, th that's the similarity and, how, and where we can kind of come together and support the needs of all the patients in the hospital, right? Because it's not that we're just there to support the needs of Christian patients um, or Muslim patients. You know, granted, if a Muslim patient wanted a, a Muslim chaplain, that is a, a, a need that we could support. But whenever we're doing our rounds on the floors, whenever we're going to visit patients, that's not what we're asking. We're not asking, what's your religion? What do you believe in? Rather, what's on your mind? What's on your heart? How can I support you today? Right? And so that's been kind of something that's been very um, impactful for me. Um, moving into the next question, obviously touching on the theme of tonight, right? The other, um, how does our religious traditions teach us on how to view issues of race, difference, etc.? So talking about our history, right? And uh, in our faith traditions, how have our histories demonstrated the similarities in terms of approaching, diff you know, uh, issues of difference, right? So we were talking about this a little bit before yeah. we started, right? So how, how do we kind of delve into that topic? Yeah. Um, I'll start and we can have a dialogue. So I think, um, so both Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, the so-called Abrahamic traditions, have a lot to say about neighbor love. And compassion and hospitality are real hallmarks of these three major religious traditions. Uh, from the vantage point of Christianity, there is this very famous text in the uh, New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, where it says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters, and also do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. So some, uh, many of us are aware of the word xenophobia, xenophobia. That's a Greek word that means fear of the stranger. Here in Hebrews 13, 2, it says, it gives you the opposite word. It says the love of the stranger it's the Greek word philozania. So it seems that they're like, okay, uh, show hospitality to strangers because by doing that, some people have shown um, hospitality to angels without knowing it. The writer is referring to Abraham treating the angels with hospitality that's spoken about in Genesis chapter 18. So connecting Jewish story with the Christian iteration. And I think one of the most beautiful things about that story is that hospitality, showing hospitality is basically when you see the face of the other, you're seeing the face of Christ. Mother Teresa, someone that you may have heard of, she said that, you know, when where can we find Jesus? She said, in the face of the other. And I think, so I think for me, the embodied knowledge is so important. I learn a lot. My best teacher in life is my wife. I learn a lot from my wife. And she and I were eating at this Thai restaurant, which is halal. And we ran into our students, our Muslim students, about five of them. And they were so happy to see 
my wife, me too, but like primarily my wife, and or and I think they were like giving. They, I mean, women can hug it like so. They were hugging each other. They were like kind of. They were like doing the, saying hello, and then we were we we said, why don't we sit down and eat together? And then uh, I was afraid of like like saying the wrong thing, to be honest with you. But my wife, in her just totally kind of inimitable way, she said. Hey, I know that you pray, and you know that we pray. So, can we pray before we eat this meal together? And I was like, "Oh no!" And then they're like, "Yes." And then she turns to me and she goes, "Can you pray for this meal?" I said, "Oh, sure, I will." And and I prayed and and just prayed in the name of God. And and we prayed and after we're done praying, um, and we shared this great meal together. And then as they were leaving, they were hugging my wife and said to her, this is the most like delightful and beautiful meal that they were, they've had since coming to Vanderbilt two years ago. Because they felt like there was somebody who was obviously a Christian who was actually saying, hey, let's, let's break bread together. And we love you and we want you to know. And she said, I'm a foreigner. She said, I'm Korean. I came from Korea to marry this guy. And then, so I'm a foreigner here. And I know you, you know, many of you are from Malaysia and, and Pakistan. And you feel like you're not, you know. But she says, you know, we all belong together in this one God. And she said, Allah or God, like, we'll figure it out when we get there. But right now, I'm called to love you and embrace you. And I think that's something that I really learned from my wife, as well as she's embodying the knowledge from Hebrews chapter 13, showing hospitality to strangers. And I think because when you embrace the stranger, when you really kind of see eye to eye and share a meal together, I think they become, you realize that they are you and you are them. Thank you so much. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, so to, to the question um, about how does um, uh, my religious tradition and being Islam look at uh, issues of difference. Um, so I, I want to maybe bring up a couple of uh, Quranic verses that uh, that really, uh, the Quran for Muslims, uh, many of you obviously are aware of this, is, is the very word of God. So it's, 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 it's the voice of God. So when Muslims read the Quran, it's, it's as if they're hearing God, right? It's, it's spoken in as if it was authored by God, right? And which Muslims believe is the case, right? So um, in, 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 in one verse so, uh, 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 of the Quran, this is chapter 30, verse 22, and of his science is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the difference of your languages and colors. Indeed, indeed, here in our signs for those who know. Another verse, this is chapter 49, verse 13, um, or Surah 49. O people, we have created you male and female, and have made you into nations and tribes, so that you may know one another. Truly, the most noble of you in the sight of God are the ones most mindful of him. God is all-knowing, all-aware. And finally, one last verse, uh, chapter 5, uh, verse 48, which actually is a, a chapter, uh, Surah Al-Ma'idah, uh, uh, has a lot to say about Christianity. And uh, as, um, we can talk a little bit more about that. But so for in this verse, quote, for each we have appointed for you a law and a way. Had God willed, he could have made you one community. But that he might try you by that which he has given you, he has made you as you are. So vie with one another in good works until God you unto God you will all return and he will inform you that wherein you deferred. So, you know, this obviously, I, you know, I could spend a lot, a lot of time on all of these passages, but the important message here is that though there is one God and we are all the creation of God, God himself mandated, willed diversity. And diversity as a good thing, difference as a positive, uh, uh, as a positive thing in his creation, and uh, as as a valuable thing. And if, if again, if looking at these verses, um, the first one basically says that differences among human beings are a sign of God, ayat Allah, right? That uh, ayat Allah in the Quran, which means sign of God, is the is is um, is 
used in the Quran as a way of uh, um, leading people back to God, right? So in the Quran, God continues to invite people to look at the, his signs in in the uh, you know on in nature among other people in the events that happen uh, in in your own thoughts to and and to take those signs and come back to God through them. So diversity in in this sense is a way of leading us back to God. Um, in the second verse, it, it talks about that you know God has made us into nations and tribes and different colors and genders and so forth, so that we may know one another, right? So that's I think is is very central, right? That uh, why has God created diversity or difference? It's so that we know one another. So what's so important about knowing one another? One way I, uh, one could look at it is that through it's only through the knowledge of the other that one truly knows oneself, right? It's, it's uh, for example, if you didn't know um, what high was, you wouldn't know what low is. You, would, you didn't know about darkness, you would not be able to recognize light and, and, and so forth. That's only through difference that one comes to truly know anything and even to truly realize who one is oneself. Um, the other verse, uh, uh, which has a similar idea that God says, you know, we could have made you one community, but we made you different so that you might vie with each other in good works. So again, it's an invitation that what is the uh, reason for diversity and difference, whether this is racial, religious, um, sexual, in any any kind of difference, it's, it's so that we compete in a good way. That's the only kind of competition, right? In, or, or even work together. It doesn't have to be competition, vying with each other in, in good works, right? In, in actions, in positive uh, uh, actions. So this is kind of the, uh, I would say, you know, at least the scriptural basis for other discussions one we can have uh, about how the Islamic tradition um, looks at, at difference or otherness. If I could just share uh, quickly, um, something came to my mind as you were speaking about the um, similarity in regards to the neighbor coming up in all three Abrahamic religions. There's a narration, um, one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, who, they said that, you know, we were afraid um, that there were so many narrations or that there were so many statements on the rights of the neighbor that we were afraid that this would come up in inheritance, that they, they were mentioned so many times that they would have a right to the inheritance, meaning that, you know, the rights of the neighbor are so high and nothing was ever mentioned about that neighbor being a Muslim, a Jew, a Christian, that it just blanket, like just generally talking about the rights of your neighbor, doing good to your neighbor. You are not a true believer if you go to sleep tonight and your neighbor is hungry. And so I think that that's so important as we carry it on. I think about it in my own um, sense, in my own community. Do I know my neighbors? The people that, you know, share the community that I live in, Am I make, do I make it a point to introduce myself, my family, you know, who we are? Ramadan's around the corner. One thing that my family likes to do is to let our neighbors know, hey, you know, we just kind of just out of consideration, right? Because we're going out to evening prayers. You know, we have a lot of family coming over for iftar. Just letting them know that if you see that there's so many people in the neighborhood almost every single night, it's the month of Ramadan, right? If we're going out, coming back in late, we just want you to know this is a month long event that happens um, where we're fasting and then we celebrate. And it's always kind of a communal habit where on Eid, we are also sending out treats and stuff like that too as well. Um, we do have to break for prayer, um, but I'm going to go ahead and ask this last question before we break for prayer. Um, again, just talking about otherness, right? So how can we or how do we relate to the other, right? We're talking about this um, idea of... Uh, you know, being good to our neighbors and, and viewing the other with like a bright face. Mm -hmm. How do we then put that into um, practice? And how has that historically been put into practice by our faith, our faiths? 
Yeah, so I think one of the things that I'm glad to do tonight is to realize that I'm not here to win a debate over my Muslim brother or sister. That's not the point. That means I'm here to engage in a conversation to learn from them here, but also uh, to encourage all of you around your tables to at least talk to each other, talk to someone that you haven't met yet, and to really kind of begin to concretely share life together, albeit in fleeting moments, albeit it could be like five minutes together, but really kind of make those small and meaningful steps toward embracing someone who is not part of your immediate community. Because we can talk a great game of, you know, all the propaganda, all the right theology and all the cultural kind of slogans, but unless and until you all and we all start practicing it together, I think it doesn't really mean much. I do think that, you know, a lot of times, in my experience, my Muslim friends feel that they are not really part of the included community, and they feel like they're outsiders. And I think that really saddens me because that is not true. Right. I mean, there. How many of you were born in America? A lot. Of, yes. Right. So then you're a U.S. born citizen. That's your American identity. And also there is a complication and complexity of our identities because sometimes race comes into play. Sometimes religion comes into play. Sometimes your family and some of you may not be able to relate with your family culture as well as because they may not understand. Like, why are you like this? You know, why? You know, you shouldn't like rock and roll. What's wrong with that? And that's what I heard. You know, my parents thought that listening to rock and roll music is satanic and I shouldn't do it. And I felt like equally in some ways distance from my parents as I did from my white kind of, you know, and American kind of African-American friends or Hispanic friends or, you know, what, what have you. And until I came to realize, you know what, we are all really created with what is called the Imago Dei, that is the image of God, that uh, there is an image of God that is shared across gender and country and you know, um, your nationality and your religion and your race, that, that God is the giver of all life, God is the taker of all life, then according to the plan of God, uh, that, that, that according to that plan, we have come here and we will leave from here. Then in the meantime, what I am called to do is to love my neighbor, and my neighbor is regardless of their you know, uh, passport or citizenship status or religious standings or cultural identity. Um, and I think that is something that, for example, in the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, it speaks very unequivocally about our unilateral commitment to the widows and the orphans and the foreigners. They say, when you go into your new settled land, do not forget them. Do not forget the widows and the orphans and the and the strangers. They didn't say what nationality, what religion it was. No, no matter what, do not forget to show kindness and compassion to them. I think that's been the part of the Christian. But then Christians are first, and we should be the first to acknowledge our own wrongdoings and misdeeds in terms of trying to practice the teachings of the Old and the New Testaments or imitating the life of Christ because Christians have done a lot of wrong things in the past, especially toward our you know, uh, Muslim neighbors. I mean, not seeing them as neighbors, first of all, and not seeing them as people created in the image of God. So I do think that on the one hand, there are some beautiful sayings both within the Christian scriptures and also in the theologies of Christian tradition. For example, John Calvin in his book, The Institutes, uh, Book 3, Chapter 7, Section 6, talks beautifully about how we are called to love all creatures because we share the image of God. And yet we have lapsed in many ways. So I think there is a... So what I've learned in my life is to really mind the gap, mind the gap between our theology and practice, our theory and practice. And knowing that God's grace kind of carries us through that gap is what kind of humbles me and also makes me joyful in encounters like this tonight. Thank you. Right, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'll take off from something you said regarding uh, um, 
you know, how uh, human beings are made in God's image. So sometimes this is, a, you know, obviously this is a part of the Bible, but it's very much a part of the Islamic tradition as well. It's in Sahih Bukhari, which is the most important book of hadith. There, there's a hadith which which uh, which says, uh, Adam ala suratihi, that God made Adam in his own image or his own form. And, and you know, one can kind of uh, try to interpret that, but... Um, also in the Quran, there's another verse that talks about that God breathes his spirit into, in, into all human beings. So we are creatures of, of, of one God, right? So we stand, we all come from one God. We're all uh, uh, what the Islamic tradition calls uh, Khalifatullah, uh, representatives, I, that's a loose translation, of, of, of God on earth, uh, who are here to realize their highest potential really, and, and, and build communities uh, that reflect that, right? So, um, the, so the way the, the question asked about, at least the first part, about how one relates to the other, uh, so one relates to the other through this idea of the one God, right? If there is one God, no matter what, uh, we are all that God's creation, we, and therefore we're all interconnected with each other, through that one God. In fact, everything gains meaning, the Islamic tradition, because it comes from God, and everything that comes from God is meaningful, is purposeful. Therefore, whether one is Muslim, Christian, any other tradition, uh, just the fact that God willed our lives and, and we come from Him and we return to Him it imbues uh, everything with meaning, right? It imbues everything with, with purpose, and that's something that Christians... Jews, Muslims, as believers in one, can God can share with each other, right? And um, the second part uh, regarding historical dimension, you know, we hear a lot about kind of Christian-Muslim conflict. Um, so it's important to remember, you know, it's 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 good to not, uh, um, um, you know, try to. Sh- shove under the carpet where there's real differences or disagreements or uh, uh, where bad things have happened, right? But at the same time, uh, the, the history of Muslims and Christians are, is uh, together is, is not only one of conflict. So, for, for example, in the life, starting from the life of the Prophet Muhammad, salat, uh, salat which means uh, pl- blessings and peace be upon him, when Muslims say the name of the Prophet. Um, so, uh, in, in the very life of the of the prophet, um, there were Christian characters, Christian uh, neighbors, companions, uh, people, Christians who had an important par- part to play in the Islamic story. Right. So, uh, just naming three of them, uh, and you can look them up if you want to uh, find more about them. Bahira, who was a monk, a Christian monk, who predicted uh, when he met the boy Muhammad the boy before he became a prophet, uh, that this will be a future prophet, right? So he, in, as far as I'm aware, in, in the Sira, in the literature of the life of the prophet, there's nobody else who makes that kind of prediction. It's a Christian monk who makes that prediction. Then once in, in the Islamic uh, um, story or narrative, the prophet receives a revelation from God. He's, you know, he's perplexed. He went to, yeah, meeting God or hearing the voice of God is, you know, extremely, uh, it can be extremely perplexing. Um, he wonders, you know, where did this voice come from? Is, you know, is he being possessed? Is, is he just delusional? And his wife, uh, uh, Khadija, uh, who's the first Muslim, uh, uh, first believer in Islam, it takes her, him to her cousin, Waraka. So Waraka ibn Nofal is a uh, Christian. And he says that what I hear from you, this is the faith of the Bible. You must be uh, uh, a prophet. God is speaking to you. Maybe you are the prophet of the Arabs. Uh, a third instance, when the Muslims, or early Muslim community, felt a persecution, uh, they were, you know, as is the case you, throughout the Bible, prophets are persecuted. People, they say challenging things that people don't want to accept, and, and, and they're persecuted. Christians know that very well because of what ha- happens to Jesus. Um, so early Muslim uh, community is, is taken in by the Najis, who is the king of Ethiopia, who is a devout Christian, and uh, who, who wept when he he- hears the Quran being recited by these people fleeing from persecution in Mecca and does not return these people, but gives them sanctuary. 
So the early Muslim community is able to be preserved because of a Christian, at least part of it, right? So they're eventually able to go back, many of them, and some of them stay in, 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 uh, in Ethiopia, and that's the first kind of community of Muslims in Africa. Um, but, you know, we could talk more, more about this, but just another instance uh, is Islamic law recognizes uh, Christians and Jews. This might not have always, you know, not every king or ruler lived up to, as, as you were talking about, lived up to the ideals of the religion, but in, under Islamic law, as pre, pre, previous people of scripture, Jews and Muslims can live peaceably, freely practice their religion in, in, in Muslim countries. And even something like the Ottoman Empire, uh, before it got involved in World War I and all these kinds of things, for years there was a millet system in which Christians uh, uh, lived, had their own laws, which were not the laws of the main country, had their own leaders, and 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 so on and so forth. So uh, I'm just uh, just giving you these examples that there are many, and one could give examples from the from the Christian side, I'm sure, and including, for example, in in uh, Europe during the Middle Ages, when uh, Muslims and Christians in Spain, for example, uh, lived in this very uh, in, in a culture of exchange where uh, uh, Christians translated things from the Syriac into Arabic, the Greek texts that were lost to Europe, and M Muslims interpreted those and they came back into Latin and really formed the foundations for a lot of, you know, our, our uh, science and philosophy in the, in, in, in the modern period. So that there are these, that it, it depends on where we take these uh, relations, right? We can take it towards conflict, or we can take it through co cooperation. In uh, uh, and we have historical examples. And finally, just on that point, I think in in the modern period, where I feel all religions are somewhat under pressure, that's I'm pulling in mildly <laughs> from a, a world from worldviews or forces that are, um, you know, you can call them materialistic or uh, secular, not in the political sense, but in the sense of the, where there's a vision, where visions of the world abound, which have nothing to do with the spiritual, ethical uh, uh, way of living. Christians and Muslims should really, uh, are, they're, they have so much in common to respond to this in, in, in ways which bring spirituality and ethics to the forefront of any important discussion that, that we can have in, in, the, in the world today. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Lim and Dr. Naeem. We're going to be taking a break right now um, for prayer. And so we're going to be praying in the back. Um, and then I believe there's going to be yes, a I'll prayer, be Doctor. Here, yeah. Hello, um, my name is Ian. Um, I, I grew up Christian and I'm kind of in a, a place in my life where I still am trying to lean more into that identity, but kind of hold it in a universalistic kind of way, which is maybe strange. But hearing the discussion was really encouraging for me, hearing from the Quran and also passages of um, the Bible, um, New Testament scripture and Old Testament scripture. But wondering if there, what kind of space there is outside of Abrahamic religions for this kind of uh, interfaith community building and, and what role what place, you know, a, a Hindu might have or an indigenous community in the U.S. have? Like, is, is there space for finding shared spirituality or shared religious practice beyond, the, you know, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity? You want me to... Okay. <laughs> well, well, we'll make it really quick, right? So the answer is yes. Um, I think we are, uh, if you take the Quran and the scripture seriously, in terms of what it, te what it teaches about the fact that we're all created, we share humanity together, that these are humanitarian concerns, whether the refugees from Ukraine or elsewhere, we should look at the fact that we're all created in the image of God, regardless of what your particular religious zip code is. I think it, uh, at least from the Christian end, as far as I know, and, and uh, Dr. Naeem can say more about how, you know, in both our traditions, we are called to really love all, uh, regardless of their kind of ethnicity or religious identity and so on, because we're called to love all, because they're all created in the image of God. Yes. So um, uh, the Quran talks about Jews and Christians as having received previous scriptures by name, 
But it, it also says that there were many other prophets uh, that who uh, ha, uh, have not been named in the Quran, but were, were sent. There's another verse uh, of the Quran that talks about to, that to every nation was sent a prophet. The, 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 and there's a saying of uh, the, the prophet, um, that there were 124,000 prophets. So the idea from that, I mean, it, it, you know, theologically one can derive is that revelation is universal. So it's possible that every spiritual tradition uh, uh, from uh, had its roots in in, in something uh, a revelation that was sent by God. And historically, there were Muslims who recognized this uh, when they encountered, for example, Zoroastrians in in, in Persia, or even uh, some people who uh, uh, in you know, we think of Hinduism as a polytheistic religion, but there's um, Hindu traditions like Advaita Vedanta and, and and so forth that are much more amenable to a uh, monotheistic understanding. There's even in place like India, there were Muslim scholars who w- saw that perhaps, you know, something like the Bhagavad Gita, this book was a previous uh, revelation that was sent or someone like Krishna might have been a prophet and these kinds of things. Um so based on that and just, you know, that, as, as Dr. Lim said, that we're all humans, uh, I think Muslims are called to participate not only with people of uh, Judaism and, and, and Christianity who are like sister and, or brother or sister religions, but also the larger human community to whom uh, God sent revelation sometime and and. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, that is interesting. Okay. Yeah. My name is Joshua. Um, I'm Christian and um, have really been blessed to get to know a lot about the Muslim faith um, this year through people like Ahmed and um, a lot of my friends around these tables and um, have really been able to see like the beauty of your religion and um, faith and um, yeah, I think one thing that I wonder about a lot, even in terms of my own faith, is um, this like tension and intersection between faith and religion. And when faith is this relationship with God and the hope for things unseen and like trusting um, Him and religion is stepping out um, in faith and like doing deeds. Um, and I'm very new to my faith. I Grew up religious, um, probably would have called myself a Christian, but did not actually know Jesus or truly love God. So I'm still kind of new to this question. So yeah, I guess a long intro to the question, but the question is, um, how would you say that your religion inspires your faith? And how would you say that your faith inspires your religion? That, that was just a very deep question. We're going to need a minute. <laughs> I actually don't know if I understand the question, though. I, I, I don't know what the distinguishing factor between your faith and your religion is. So faith is your relationship with God, and the religion is the outworking of your faith? Is that what you mean? Yeah, religion is like certain like outworking of your faith or deeds. Um, could I just share my perspective? Yeah. So, um, as a Muslim, when if I were to translate faith and religion, religion is the word deen, right? So religion in Islam is deen, um, whereas faith is iman, okay? So faith is um, something, when we look at how faith is described, it's um, related to belief, right? Belief in a creator, belief in angels, belief in the prophets, belief in the books, belief in the day of judgment, all of these type of things. Whereas Dean is kind of like our religion, what we're given, you know, kind of the way that we walk in our lives, right? Um, How do we practice 
this religion in our life. And so I think that there is a relationship between the two in that one is something that we, I guess, can see sometimes. Like for, for me as a Muslim, my religion, I get my religion from the Quran, right? So the Quran being the book that I follow that is is the, is the word of God. And I can see, I can physically see it, right? I can learn what is being said and, and kind of engage with this in a physical sense. Whereas the belief aspect, belief in God, I can't see God for me. I don't see Allah, but I know that he is he exists. I see him in the signs, right? I see him in the things that he shows me um, in my relationship with him. And then I can, you know, again, with the prophets. and So I think for me, at least, when I think about those two things, um, there is a deep relationship between the two and and they both inspire one another and they could not exist without the other. Okay, well, I think that's... <laughs> um, I think you really summed it up well. I, I would say that um, just as a interesting example... Um, so I was telling her that one of the most memorable uh, speaking engagements that I had was to give a talk at the University of Istanbul in their Faculty of Islamic Theology, where uh, about 300 students were there and, I don't know, about 30 faculty. And But almost all the students were female and almost all the students were wearing, is it burqa? Is it like a, no, no. Like, so, like, basically all I could see was their eyes. And the talk was about the Trinity. So I was able to share my faith. But then what really mattered, as the book of James says, faith without deed is like dead. So I thought, you know, what really mattered to me was not only to talk about my belief in, you know, the triune God, but to really the religion part, that's the faith part. But the religion part is to really kind of demonstrate my faith in the God, the Creator, God, the Redeemer, God, the Sanctifier, by really kind of embracing the the other, you know, in terms of not physically, but, you know, figuratively speaking, just really recognizing that um, uh, that they were, they are creating the image of God, they are studying theology, they are trying to get closer and closer to God, and to really see that as a beautiful effort to really respond to God's grace. I think both uh, Islam and Christianity both recognize that there is a priority of God, meaning God precedes all beings and all things. And so it is a response to revelation. That means that is, there is a prior act of God that is to give, uh, you know, God's self to us, whether through the Quran or through Jesus Christ. And and so I think, to me, that that is where it really matters, like how I treat the other, how I really embrace... So I, I am increasingly impatient with grace-sounding theologies that does nothing. And I think that's something that I've learned while in Istanbul, just seeing the, the really beauty of the, the students who really wanted to practice their faith by learning about it. And it really kind of prompted me to do the same as well. It's a little tall for me. Um, thank you both. So... Growing up in rural America, it wasn't like I encountered many Muslims growing up. It probably wasn't until I was a TA until I actually encountered someone who practiced Islam. So in that vein, I know I probably had misconceptions. So one question for both of you would be, like, what's one question, misconception about Christianity you would like to tell someone who's a Muslim? And what's something about Islam that you would like to maybe tell a Christian who might have a misconception? So thank you both. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's lots of misconceptions, <laughs> but <laughs> but um, but one one since we've been talking about the idea of the one God, right, uh, as as part of our conversation, and the one God who made us all, and and, and so on. Um, uh, some folks have, uh, and this is you know, I've seen it in the media. I've seen it uh, with some Christians I've spoken to, who have this idea that Allah is the Muslim God kind of like Zeus is the god of the ancient Greeks or something like that. Well, uh, the Allah in Arabic just means the god. 
So Muslims are talking about the very same God and actually calling to account the same kind of history, uh, sacred history, uh, that uh, Christians and Jews believe in. From Adam eating of the tree down to stories of Noah and Abraham and uh, Joseph and um, uh, Moses and Jesus and all the way. So uh, Muslims believe in, in the same, the very same God, right? So Arab Christians, for example, oftentimes use the word Allah to refer to as God they always have. They have some other names too, but that's that's one way that they refer to uh, to God, and and uh, even uh, Hebrew terms like Elohim that you find in 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 uh, the Hebrew Bible, uh, they're exactly from the same root uh, uh, that Allah comes from, right? And uh, so yeah, so that would be you know I would say that you know that thinking that Muslims believe. Uh, Muslims worship a special god called Allah is kind of thinking that the French-speaking people worship a special god called Dio or the Spanish uh, worship a god called Dios or something like that. Thank you. That's really helpful and that's related to what I was going to say and I would say that to my um, Islamic friends here that Christians do not worship three gods when they say we believe in God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I think that's, I think oftentimes like, oh, you believe in three, you're a tritheist. I mean, when you look at the history of the kind of theological conversations and controversies between Muslims and Christians, it often converged on that and correspondingly about uh, Jesus and, and the deity of Jesus. And I think that's, um, yeah, so it's an understandable kind of critique. And I would say that we don't worship three gods, but one God. So that's, that's to your question. So. Yeah, uh, can I just uh, ask you for a follow-up on that? Sure, sure. How would you explain, because I have to do this in classes and, and so forth as yeah. well, how would you explain the Trinity and how it's a, u a unity to, to Muslims? Yeah. I mean, it's a big question you could probably... Right, right, right. So, 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 I know, right? So I wrote a book that's 500 pages long. <laughs> uh, it really was published, published by Oxford University Press in 2012, and it even won like some prize, but... Somebody asked me, can you explain, do you know more about the Trinity now that you've written a 500-page book? And I said, uh, not really, but, <laughs> but I, don't, I didn't stop believing in it. So I, I think I would say this, though. I think one of the, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, aside from, um, I mean, there, there is this kind of, you know, mystical tradition within Islam, too. But I think the pre predominant part of Christian theology recognize that God is ultimately beyond knowing. Like, you cannot, so then if God has existed in a way that is God is always in three while in one, Christians were able to get around it or embrace it by saying, God is ultimately mystery because God has always existed, and and for God to be God, if uh, for you to know everything about God, then you are God, because you actually figure God out. So I think within this kind of a tradition of Christian theology, there is a big uh, thing called um, the technical term is apophatic theology or mystical theology that really kind of recognizes that God is ultimately beyond knowing. Now, for some people, especially if everything has to be rational and explainable, that seems like a terrible cop out. Like to say, like, well, you cannot really know God ultimately, but God is Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, okay, but what is that? So I think Christians really struggle. I think they're uh, in in the book. I talk about the fact that. Uh, with the advent of Jesus, the problem of God became more intensified. Meaning, like, the followers of Jesus began to say that in when you see Jesus, you are encountering God. So does that mean that Christ is the revealer of God, who reveals the identity of God? But if he reveals who God is, is he himself God? That became one of the real kind of a, a troublesome controversy within the early Christian community. But by the time that you have um, the the clo like the completion of the New Testament text, it seems like the emerging consensus among Christians was that Christ is not only a revealer of God, but by equating himself to be in the special relationship with God, 
many of the um, opponents of Jesus said, you are a blasphemer because you, a mere mortal, are claiming to be God. So there are uh, New Testament texts that attest to that. But also at the same time, I have to be honest, like when uh, there are plenty of the writings of Paul, St. Paul, the Apostle Paul, where he makes, he calls God, Jesus is our Lord, and and his Father and his God is God. So I think there's certainly there, I would say there are themes within, ten, uh, there are tension within these themes that on the one hand unequivocally talks about the fact that Jesus is unique, unlike any other human beings, including prophets. But then, you know, what do we do with it? So I was telling her about this very uh, important scholar, Professor Mona Siddiqui. She's Pakistan, yeah, at the University of Edinburgh. And then she wrote a really, really important book about, you know, Jesus uh, and it's Jesus, um, Jesus, Islam, and... God, God, Jesus, and Islam. Something, something like, like that. I know, okay. the three words. And, and, and But it's a very important book that I've used for a textbook. And she actually does a great job coming from an unapologetically, you know, Islamic standpoint. Her uh, uh, recognize, uh, her telling the readers that Jesus is very important in Islam. And this is how we, uh, where we agree and where we disagree. I think it's, and so when I teach the class on history of Muslim Christian relations, we spend about two weeks talking about Jesus in Islam and Jesus in Christianity. And then we just let the students, like, you decide. I mean, because I'm not trying to, like, convince them one way or another. It's not, my classes are history classes. I'm not trying to convince them of, like, this is the right theology and that's not the right theology. So hope that helps. Yeah, that, that's very helpful. So it's pretty clear that in the world, a larger and larger percentage of people are becoming agnostic, atheist, and secular in whatever, any other way. And so my question, it's somewhat related to a conversation we had at our table, is what is Islam and what is Christianity's response to the growing secularism within our world? Yeah. That's a great question. All right. Yeah. So, um, you know, this is something that I, um, I'm very interested in. Um, I spoke about briefly in the introduction is that I, I, I think that the religious perspectives, spiritual perspectives, whether they're Christian, Jewish, Muslim, or as, as uh, I forget your name, but you brought up uh, a indigenous, shamanistic, a Hindu, Buddhist, um, that uh, religious and spiritual perspectives are given alternative perspective on both the big questions that human beings have always asked and are still continue to ask who are we where did we come from is there a, a you know did someone create us uh, is there an afterlife how do we live our lives well what is the good life these kinds of questions but also uh, these spiritual and religious traditions offer alternative visions based on the fact that they're rooted in an understanding of human beings and of the world, which is not based on human beings as just a bunch of molecules or, you know, purely quantitative understanding of nature where nature is just something that you measure. It's something other than you, which I believed is one of the reasons, which I believe is one of the reasons that we have the environmental crisis because we cut ourselves off from, from nature. Uh, and, and saw it as just an object of study and later on of exploitation. Um, so I think religious perspectives are extremely valuable to uh, to give alternative visions for some of the per, both perennial questions as well as some of the greatest challenges of our time, everything from the environmental crisis to racism to... Um, uh, you know, kind of the misuse of technology as we move, you know, to a world where, you know, we might be overtaken by artificial intelligence and we love our gadgets uh, and, and so on and so many other questions like that. So um, I, I think that uh, people of, of religion uh, should not be, um, should not feel defensive against the, sec you know, uh, secular perspectives. I think because they have really valuable resources that I would strongly say are much greater than many of the secular answers to these questions. And, and they can draw on them and develop them. And they can do that in 
while speaking with each other. So it's it's a way of of kind of inter uh, um, uh, interaction between different religions to face kind of common uh, common threat threats.